Calvary Chapel. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Calvary Chapel. Oh. Blessed to have you with us tonight. And I'm looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us. So let's just take it to him in prayer. Father, we just come to you, Lord, and we thank you for, Lord, just your goodness, your grace, and, Father, just the mercy that you give to us, Lord, that, Father, we were dead in our sins, and you died, and you purchased us for yourself, Lord, and just the, the blood that was shed, and the, the death that you, that you died, and paid the price, Lord, for us. And Lord, we just can never, never thank you enough. And uh, Lord, we're just so grateful for just your loving kindness and, and the grace that you've just poured out upon our life. We ask God that you would just uh, take tonight that Lord, you would, by your Holy Spirit, Guide us, lead us, and direct us in you, Lord, and in the things of you that, Lord, we would just come out the other side just deeper and richer in our relationship with you and just a greater degree of intimacy, Lord. And, Lord, just give to us your knowledge, your wisdom, Lord. Father, we just would be in harmony, Lord, with you, and just the things that are important to you would be important to us, Lord. We love you, and we just thank you for tonight. Father, we ask God that you would anoint the message by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, and that, Father, you would uh, just dig deep, Lord, for us, that we might receive the full blessing and just the full benefit of your word to us. We love you, Father. We ask God that you would just be with all the uh, electronics and, Lord, just the, the gadgets and such that need to continue to run to get the message out. And, Lord, we would just give you the honor, the glory, and the praise and just ask for your hand in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now. I see so clearly Hallelujah, grace like rain falls down on me Hallelujah, all my sins they're washed away, they're washed away T'was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed falls down on me Hallelujah All my stains they're washed away they're washed away When we 
been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing your praise than when we first begun, when we first begun, hallelujah, praise like rain falls down on me, hallelujah, my stay. I searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise Treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace will find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who cares You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You're the only one who can Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you Lord, there's nothing 
nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who cares you turn graves into garden you turn bones into army you turn seas into highways, you're the only one who can, you're the only one who can.
are a moment You are forever Lord of the ages God before time We are a vapor You are eternal Love everlasting Reigning on high Holy, holy Lord God Almighty Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Highest praises, honor and glory Be unto
set me on fire. Here I am, God, arms wide open. Pouring out my life, gracefully broken. My heart stands in awe of your name, your mighty love stands. Strong to the end, you will fulfill your purpose for me. You won't forsake me. You will be with me. Here I am, God, arms wide open. Pouring out my life, gracefully broken. Now, all to Jesus now, holding nothing back, holding nothing back. I surrender, I surrender, I surrender. I 
give you my soul I live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I'm awake Lord, have your way in me Lord, I give you my heart I give you my soul I live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I'm awake Lord, have your way
Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. <laughs> we thank you, Lord God, that you are the God of blessings and that you have taken the curse on yourself so that we could have those blessings poured out immeasurable, Lord. And uh, we thank you so much that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we can know, Lord, apprehend, comprehend the height and the depth and the length and the width, Lord. It's just so far beyond our imaginings, but Father, you, you put it in our grasp, Lord, to know you, and what a gift, Lord. Just can't even say thank you enough, God, for all that you do for us. You make us your children. You, you set our feet on the rock, Jesus Christ, and you give us life everlasting, and Lord, just on and on, there's so many things we can be thankful for, and we ask that you would help us expand our hearts, God, so that we can catch a glimpse, Lord, of, of all that you give us and all that you are in us and, and your awesome, amazing plan for us, Lord. We know that your plans are, are for a hope and a future, Lord, and that we wait on you. When we wait on you, we, we can rise up with wings like eagles and and fly with you, Lord, and we can be still and know that you are God in our lives. Lord, we ask that you help us with these things. Help us to seek you early, every day, and to find you, God, and be found of you, and to make known to everyone we come in contact who you are. Lord, that your name would be high and lifted up and glorified in us and through us, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, and everyone said Amen. Amen. Bless one another, guys. Uh-oh. Are you going to have enough voice left? Okay, hello everybody. <laughs> Happy Wednesday. You know, um, yeah, we're not we're not going to meet again until next year. <laughs> A whole year away. <laughs> yeah, do you guys have New Year's resolutions? What happened was in July we did the the movie thing, right? And I wound up losing about. 10 pounds because we were working 14 hour days, getting about five hours sleep. And um, so I came, finally came back to church and Ike says, 
I said, look at this, I lost all this weight. And he says, you'll gain it back. That's the curse of Ike. So I gained it back plus more. So now, so now what I'm going to do is uh, New Year's, I'm going to try to cut out dessert. That's, that, I'm going to eat everything else, but just cut out dessert. Because that, that's my downfall, is I'll, I'll have a good breakfast, good lunch, good dinner. And then for dessert, then I'll have ice cream or cookies or chocolate or something. So if I could just cut that out, I'll be fine. But. <laughs> yeah, I know. Don't, no, don't, don't do that, Ike, now. See, last time you did that, and I gained 12 pounds. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, the curse of Ike. Okay, anyway, um, we're in Exodus chapter 7 tonight, and so I'll read a, um, the first little section of it. Um, it goes down to verse, verse 25. I'm gonna, I'll read the first seven verses. That's, that's one section. So the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet. And you shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron, your brother, shall, let Pharaoh, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of the land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you, so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by, by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Then Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded them, so they did. And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the rain that you've been giving us, and we needed that. And uh, please continue to do so until this uh, drought is over. You give rain off and on, you know. So some years we have drought, some years we have rain, and, but we don't panic because you know that you're in control of everything. Please uh, anoint the pastor tonight as he teaches us from your word, and we do praise you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. Are you all in Exodus chapter 7? <laughs> of course you are. Because you go to Calvary Chapel Concord. Amen. Okay. You ever had one of those days where it seemed like everything just kind of unraveled? You pretty much know what I'm talking about. And I've had those on many occasions. And so... There are times when I walk into my office and sit down and begin to prepare for a study and my mind is just full of disappointments and the problems that I've been facing throughout the day, the week, or the month, whatever it might be. But then as I sit down and I begin to open up the Word to a passage like the one that is before us tonight and I realize, it doesn't take me long to realize I should say, just the foolishness of, of <laughs> what I'm thinking. I mean, seeing the plagues that these people endured, I have no other choice but to bow my head and say, Lord, forgive me. What a baby I've been. You know, it's it just one of those things. And not only did the people in Exodus account uh, the Exodus event, not only did they face, face difficulties that, I, quite frankly, dwarf my own, but the world in, in, as well is headed for an unspeakably trying time referred to as the tribulation. Described for us in Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 19. The tribulation is the seven year period when God is going to pour out his wrath upon the world that rejected his son. Now, 
I take and I tie the plagues of Exodus together with the tribulation of Revelation because there's a remarkable correlation a correlation between the two. In both the Exodus and the Revelation accounts, the nation of Israel is afflicted. In Exodus, <clears throat> they were oppressed by Pharaoh. And then in the tribulation period, they will be oppressed by the Antichrist specifically and by the whole world in general. In both cases, God's people cry out to God in desperation. And in both cases, God hears their cry. Exodus chapter 2, Jeremiah 31, verse 18 through 20, if you want to look at it later. In both of these accounts, God demands that the oppressor let his people go. In Exodus, it's in Exodus chapter 5. In Revelation, or in the tribulation, it is Isaiah chapter 43. Interestingly, we're seeing this begin to happen even now. The population of the state of Israel, I just checked it this morning, is presently 9,217,000, which intrigues me because in the Holocaust of World War II, which created the climate for the nation to come, that is the nation of Israel, to come into existence. But during that time, six million Jews were killed. And then you look at the present population, it exceeds the Holocaust six million deaths, which in turn speaks to me, or speaks to me of what God declared when he said in Joel chapter 2 in verse 25, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. God has done that and more so than that. In the Exodus story, Pharaoh didn't want the Jews to go. Likewise, in the tribulation period, there'll be that same tendency. God will demand that his people be set free. And again, we have a sneak preview of that happening right now. In the wake of the collapse years ago now of the Soviet Union, immediately 66,000 Jews returned to the promised land. Of that number, 54,600 or 83% came from Russia, from the north, to repopulate the land of Israel. But because nearly 60% of those returning to Israel from Russia were physicians, college professors, academians, musicians, artists, there is presently for that reason what I would refer to as a brain drain from Russia. Maybe you look at Russia and you read the news and you think, why did they do that? I think this has something to do with it. But the smartest and the wisest, the top of the class, is what left Russia to go back to their country, Israel. And that is why it is commonly believed that soon there will be a closing of the door in the north. In the Exodus story, two witnesses, Moses and Aaron, are being raised up to speak to the Pharaoh. In Revelation chapter 11, two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, we believe, give understanding on the streets of Jerusalem. In the Exodus story, we see water turn to blood. We see boils on people, frogs hopping throughout the land, darkness covering the nation, swarming flies and locusts, hailstorms causing great consternation. So too in the tribulation, we see water turn to blood, locusts swarming, boils upon the people, frogs and hailstones as big as VW buses or bugs. And in the Exodus account, Pharaoh hardened his heart. The people not killed by the plagues and the tribulation will harden their heart as well. Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. 
And yet in both cases, Israel is delivered in Exodus. They eventually arrived at the promised land. Romans chapter 11, verse 25 and 26 tell us that although Israel will go through the time of Jacob's trouble in the tribulation, eventually though, all of Israel shall be saved. And if God keeps his promises to Israel, he will keep his promises that he has made to you and to I as well. Israel is proof of God's faithfulness, guys, to you and to me. So with that in mind, notice verse 1. Aaron, the spokesman. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet. Moses has made his first appearance before Pharaoh, making his famous demand, let my people go. But instead of letting the people go, Pharaoh responded by making things harder for the Israelites. You remember taking away the straw and maintaining the production, the number that needed to be produced. The people have now begun to complain to Moses for causing things to get worse instead of getting better. And when God tells Moses to go back to Pharaoh and once again repeat the demand, Moses responds in chapter 6, verse 30, and says, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh heed me? Verse 2, chapter 7 says, You shall speak all that I command you. And Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. God oftentimes speaks to people through a prophet. Instead of Moses speaking directly to Pharaoh, and we know the story behind that, he would give his message unto Aaron, and Aaron would be the one that would be speaking unto Pharaoh. God goes on and says, verse 3, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Now, some have trouble with this God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And it seems as if Pharaoh doesn't have a choice in it as far as what's going to happen. Ten times in the Bible, it mentions that God hardens the heart of Pharaoh. Pharaoh, chapter 4, verse 21, 7, chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. But you need to pay attention because the actual hardening of Pharaoh's heart begins with Pharaoh hardening his own heart ten times. It begins in chapter 7 and verse 13, then verse 14, then verse 22, chapter 8, 15, 19, 32, and on and on. But there's a hardening of his own heart that is taking place. But God says to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you. And he's not going to heed you so that I can lay up my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. One of the purposes of allowing Pharaoh's heart to get harder and harder will be for God to demonstrate his awesome power. If Pharaoh let the people go on the first request, then the world wouldn't have any idea as to Yahweh's power in comparison with the Egyptian gods. There always would be that, that, that thought left out there that, oh, the Egyptian gods could have conquered God was going to leave no doubt. He was going to leave no stone unturned, no conjecture, no nothing. He wasn't going to leave anything for the Egyptians to begin to wonder about. And so out of the land of Egypt, they would go by great judgments to judge, to govern, to vindicate, to punish. The judgment would be upon Egypt's gods. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, we read, And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. 
Now, you got to know that the Egyptians had many gods. One website I went to listed 114 Egyptian gods. You could say that the Egyptians were very religious, just from the British Museum's list of them. A few of the examples of these gods, Amun. Amun was a man with a ram head, considered the king of the gods at one point. Anubis, a man with a jackal's head, the god of embalming and the dead. Happy, a man with a pot belly. He was connected with the Nile, the god connected with the yearly flooding of the Nile that was so important to the Egyptian farming and the Egyptian prosperity. Horus was a man with a hawk head, the god of the sky, considered the protector of the ruler of Egypt. And the pharaoh was considered the living Honus. Asis is a woman with a headdress shaped like a throne. And she was the mother of Horus, and important since each pharaoh was considered as that living Horus. She was known for powerful magical spells that would help the people as she did her incantations. Kunum was a man with the head of a curly horned ram. He was the guardian of the Nile, a creator god, connected with the yearly flooding there in the Nile. Osisiris is a mummified man with a white cone head. He was god of the dead, ruler of the underworld, god of resurrection and fertility. It was thought that the Nile was the lifeblood of Osisiris. And then you have Ra that I think most people know. A man with a hawk head and a headdress shaped like the sun. He was the sun god, the most important god of the ancient Egyptians. He was swallowed every night by the sky goddess Nut. And they're all nuts, I think, when you look at this. But Ra, Horakati, is the combination of the gods Ra and Horus, the god of the rising sun. And then the last one I'll share with you, Sobek. Is a man with a crocodile head. Uh, again, one of the gods of the Niles and protector of Pharaoh. His temple had pools with live crocodiles in them. Verse 5 in our text tonight, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So God is making a point. And God instructs Moses, Moses, go and speak to Pharaoh. He won't listen to you, but that will give me the opportunity to stretch out my hand upon the land of Egypt. And as a result, the entire nation will know that I am the Lord and that there is none that is like me. And so the Lord goes to Moses and says, Moses, yes, there's going to be some problems. Moses, there's going to be some tribulation. There's going to be some difficulties. Oftentimes, the very same thing that he shares with you and with I as we go through those tribulations or those difficulties and those, those you know, things that happen within our life that are somewhat unsettling. And so there would be problems, there would be tribulation, there would be difficulty, all of which would affect God's people as well. Not just the the Egyptians, but God's people, Israel, as well. But the thing that you need to understand, the thing that we need to learn as well, is that it's all a part of God's purpose and God's plan. Not uh, to not only provide liberation for His children, but to give revelation unto the Egyptians. And so He's providing that liberation. He's providing a way out that they're going to be delivered, that there's going to be deliverance that's given that they'll get out of Egypt, they'll get out across the Red Sea into the wilderness, and they'll begin their journey to the promised land. That is a given. That's going to happen. But not only that, I'm going to use you as a testimony. I'm going to use you to reveal to the Egyptians the great and mighty power of God. We cry, Lord, liberate me. Lord, set me free from the snap of those whips of those Egyptian oppressors. Lord, set me free from the bondage of baking bricks under the desert sun. And the Lord says, gladly, gladly I'll do that. For that 
really is what my intention is. But I'm also doing something else simultaneously. I'm also doing something else at the same time. You see, you got to understand, Moses, I want the Egyptians. I want the unsaved, the lost souls to see my power. I want them to be able to understand my reality. The same thing that God wants and desires today. That a lost and dying world that has turned its back on God, that they would understand the reality of God. That they would see the power of God. And God says to Moses, for that to happen, there will be a series of problems which will affect not only them, but it's going to affect you. It's going to affect the Egyptians and Israel. It's going to affect us as believers in Christ and Israel. That is the Exodus account and the Revelation account. It's going to affect both. Now, a lot of times we might come to a point in our life where we say, you know what? I'm tired of my situation. My boss is a jerk. He's mean. My trials are great in the home, in the neighborhood, you know, at work. And, and you know, it just, I mean, the pandemic has made it even worse. And we've got people and mental health issues and, and, you know, events within people's lives have exploded exponentially. We've shared it with you guys before, the abusive behavior, you know, the spousal abuse and, husband, you know, the, the, uh, uh, just within the, the, the confines of the relationship and the marriage and, and, and kids and, and adults. I, I was reading an article the other day that said, Alcohol con- consumption has gone up something like 17% or something like that. It's just an outrageous number. And people are numbing themselves down. People are learning how to self-medicate more than they ever have before. And they're using these things. They're utilizing those things to take the pain away, to take away the, the whole necessity of having to deal with these issues and deal with these problems in their life. And so the Lord says, there's a couple things I'm doing here at the same time. You know, and, and, and like I said, you know people, you know believers, you know, and, and they look at this and they say, you know, you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand the problems. Why, Lord, don't you set me free? And that's at the time he says, I will in due season. Heaven's just around the bend. But why do I have to endure this trial, Lord? Why can't you take the cancer away immediately? Don't you have that ability? Why can't you solve the problem today? Why can't you work now? And that's where the Lord comes in and says, I've, I've got a couple of things that I'm doing at the same time. Yes, I'm bringing you into the land of promise. But at the same time, again, there are Egyptians who are watching carefully to see how you handle the same trials that they're facing. Guys, you're a witness, you're a testimony. Your life is showing them that our God is a good God, that he's a powerful God. And God says to us, I want them to see my power because they're watching carefully to see how you handle it. I want them to see what I can do I want to show them that I can see you through this and get you to the other side. You see, dear saints, listen. Seeing you win the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes, that doesn't cause the Egyptian to scratch his head and say, wow, how does he do that? Well, no, duh, you know. No, the Egyptian scratches his head when he sees you facing problems on the job, when he sees you facing difficulties in the family, setbacks financially, difficulties physically, and yet, and yet, they marvel at it because somehow you walk through them victoriously and you secure the victory. God never promised to protect us from problems. He promised to see us through the problems. And as he does, then the neighbor and the co-worker and the brother 
and the sister-in-law or the father, they say, you know what? There's something about the way that you navigate life that I just can't do. And they'll look at that and they say, how do you do that? I can't. I, I can't for the life of me figure out how to make it through this thing. You know, and so they try the alcohol and they try the dumbing down type, you know, pieces of paraphernalia or whatnot to, the, to just take away and numb the pain that they're experiencing. But it doesn't work. Maybe for a short time, but it doesn't work. And they look at you and say, why aren't you drinking yourself into stupidity? Why aren't you doing this or doing that and just, you know, numbing the pain that you're experiencing? Why? And this gives God an opportunity to demonstrate the power and the reality, the grace and the goodness of God. It gives you the opportunity to say, He's available to you. See, there is something about the way you navigate your life. It has nothing to do with your ability, your proudness, your, your talents, your capabilities or whatever. It has nothing to do with that. It's God in you. It's God in you. You know, that power, that strength, that understanding, that wisdom, that knowledge. You know, it's, it's in spite of you is what it actually is. Not because of you. Not because of what your abilities and talents and resources and such are. But it's in spite of you. And there is really something about the way that you navigate your life that they can't do. But it has nothing to do with because you're so good and whatnot. But I tell you what you can say. You can look at them and say, when they say, what is it? Who is it? How is it? Why is it? How are you doing that? You can look at them and say, you know, it's the power and the reality of God. It is the power and the reality of God. It is the grace and the goodness of God. And I want you to know that he is available to you as well. It is such an obvious truth, but one so easily forgotten. Guys, God does not exist for me. God does not exist for you. It's a shock to remember and a hard thing for me to grab a hold of and wrap my arms around. But God has a bigger plan than merely my comfort. Oh, no, really? Oh, no. You'd be surprised how many Christians look at that and go, really? He's got a bigger agenda than my comfort? Yes, he does. He's got a greater concern than simply my ease or your ease. He says, I'm taking you to the land of milk and honey where every tear shall be wiped away, where every problem will be solved. But in the meantime, in the meantime, the Egyptians, in the meantime, the world, this world in which we are occupying until he comes, guess what? They need to see that I am the Lord. And the Lord would come and say, I want to use you as the vessel. I want to use you as the instrument. Because you see, them seeing that I am the Lord and that they need a relationship with me will happen when they see you make your way through the deep waters because I am with you, because I'm leading you, because I'm guiding you, because I'm taking you through. So what we're going to see through these plagues that come forth, these plagues that Moses calls down upon Egypt is a judgment against many of the Egyptian gods. That's what it's going to do. And Yahweh is going to show his people, the Israelites, as well as the Egyptians, just who the boss is, so to speak. There are a couple of lessons here for us to grab a hold of, and that is, number one, God is bigger. We're seeing that already. It seems to me that one of the biggest lessons from Exodus is that deliverance and freedom come when I understand that God's bigger than my problem. We forget that. I know you know that, but we forget that. Forgetful Sam, you know, or oh, forgot. God is bigger than my problems. God is bigger than my issues. God is bigger than anything that I'm going through currently. Whatever it might be, misunderstanding, you know, just a separation, a brokenness, a broken heart, an aching heart. God is bigger than any problem that you have. And one of the steps they teach you for getting away from addiction 
is to learn that you are powerless over your addiction. But that alone by itself only leads to hopelessness. Oh, what do you mean? I'm powerless over my addiction? I might as well go jump off a bridge, right? And that's what you see a lot of times because there's a hopelessness. There's a helplessness. But true deliverance comes when I understand that God is bigger than the things that I'm enslaved to. God is bigger than the things that I have become and you have become enslaved to. And that could be a range of things. Alcohol, drugs, it could be pornography, it could be any number of things that you've become captive to, that you've become addicted to. Guys, understand that God is bigger. God is bigger than your problem. And deliverance comes when I understand that he's bigger than all the things that I'm enslaved to. Lesson number two, just again, it goes back to that witness to, to Egypt. And this is a repeat. I want to, it's important enough, I think, to repeat it. When we are in a difficult situation, we cry out, God, deliver us. We want everything to be fixed now, don't we? We want it all tidy, nice and neat and no problems. But then God allows it to go just a little bit longer. And sometimes the reason isn't because of me, but because of the people around me who are watching me. It's important that they see how I react, how I respond, how I depend upon the Lord and rely upon His strength in my situations because there's many people that are watching. And they may not be that impressed if I win the lottery and I'm able to straighten out the majority of my issues. But I tell you what, they do watch. They watch how I handle life and how you handle life when we're under the same boss that they hate so much. And they want to see what you're going to do about it. Are you going to stick it out? Are you going to, you know, tuck it in? Or what, what are you going to do? It seems that there was a young man named Saul. He was acquainted with a Christian by the name of Stephen. He probably had heard Stephen give brilliant arguments in the synagogue about how Jesus was the Messiah. But it seemed that the thing that impressed Saul the most about Stephen was when he was watching him, he was watching him being stoned. And he heard Stephen utter these words in Acts chapter 7, verse 60, when he said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. All the other things that could have impressed Paul really didn't. The thing that really grabbed a hold of him, the thing that really shook him into his very foundation was, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. They're killing you, Stephen. Do you understand what that means? Lord, do not lay this to their account. Do not charge them with this sin. Verse 6, Then Moses and Aaron did so as God instructed. Just as the Lord commanded them, so they did. Oh, that's a great word for us tonight. Because I fear that there's a lot of Christians today that are not doing what the Lord is commanding. Not doing what the Lord is telling them to do. And they're sitting there after the fact wondering, why are things going so bad? Why do I feel so bad? Why am I so down, so depressed, so struggling with all these things? Well, did you do what the Lord told you to do? Well, you know, it was too hard. Or no, I, I actually, I didn't get around to it. Do what he tells you to do. Do what he commands you to do. And that's exactly what Moses and Aaron did. They did exactly what the Lord commanded them to do. And Moses, notice, was 80 years old. Aaron, 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Not bad for a bunch of a couple of old guys, right? Getting old can be kind of tough. You know that, don't you? I'm learning that more and more every single day. A golden anniversary party was thrown for an elderly couple and the husband, moved by the occasion, wanted to tell his wife just what he felt about her. She was very hard of hearing, however, and often misunderstood what he said. And with many family members from friends gathered around, he toasted her with Martin Ellis. And he said, my dear wife, after 50 years, I found you tried and true. When he said that, everybody smiled with approval and toasted. But his wife said, eh? And so he repeated it louder. After 50 years, I found you tried and true. His wife harumphed and shot back. Well, let me tell you something. After 50 years, I'm tired of you too. 
But getting old doesn't have to mean you have to quit. It doesn't. Maybe there's still more for you to do. Anna Marie Robertson, Moses was her name. Affectionately, she was known as Grandma Moses. She was born on a farm in Washington County, New York. Without any formal training and largely self-educated, she began to paint rural scenes at the age of 78. Her work was discovered in 1939 by Louis Caldor, a New York engineer, who first saw her paintings exhibited in a drugstore window at Hoosick Falls, New York. In 1939, three of her landscapes were displayed in a private showing to members of the New York Museum of Modern Art, among other works by contemporary unknown painters. In 1940, the Gallery of St. Antine in New York City presented her the first one-woman show. Thereafter, Grandma Moses had more than 100 exhibits throughout the United States, over half of which were confined exclusively to her work. Since 1950, her paintings have been exhibited in Europe and really around the world. She amazingly lived to be 101 years old, but I guess the point is that you're never too old to begin your life's most important work, which is what that became. Guys, don't look at your life right now and think, man, it's over. I got nothing else to do. No, you got more to do. And so verse 8, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourselves. Then you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. When Moses was reluctant to answer God's call to deliver the Israelites, one of Moses' objections was that the people might not believe that God had sent Moses. If you remember back in chapter 6, God's response was to give Moses three signs or three miracles to perform in front of the Israeli um, leadership and leaders so that he could prove to them that God was, he was on a mission from God. And then also to use them when he went the first time before Pharaoh. And so here God's response was to give him these three signs or miracles to perform in front of the people. The first sign involved Moses' rod becoming a serpent. Exodus chapter 4 verse 2. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And so he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran away from it. He was scared of it. Now this sign is going to be performed by Aaron and his rod in front of Pharaoh as well. The serpent is kind of interesting. The word that is used here um, compared to the one in Exodus chapter 4 verse 3. It's a different word. There's two different words for serpent, and it has to do with the size of the snake, okay, or the serpent itself. Some have suggested that the serpent in Exodus 7 was a bigger, bigger snake, and you'll see why in a second. Verse 10, so Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent but Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. How did the magicians copy the miracle? Over the years, there have been suggestions that have been given. Some think it was a sleight of hand, like a card trick. Others have suggested that the magicians might have been trained in handling snakes. We don't really know exactly for sure. Uh, some types of cobras can be made stiff as a board if you press the right spot. Some have suggested that this was nothing more than demonic power at work. We know the names of at least two of these magicians. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, they're given to us as Janus and Jambres. But you have to understand the world has its tricks. God is not the only one who is powerful. There's a prince of the power of the air. When the Antichrist comes, he'll perform miracles. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, 
and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And our text tonight, verse 12, goes on to say, For every man threw down his rod, and became, they became serpents. So Aaron takes his rod, and he casts it down, and it becomes, becomes a snake. The magicians cast down their rods, and they become snakes as well. Paul identifies them, as I said, as Janus and Jambres, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. And again, how were they able to duplicate this miracle? I think probably by tapping into demonic and occultic power with which the Egyptian culture was very, very, very familiar. Verse 12 goes on, but Aaron's rod, guess what it did? Verse 12, swallowed up their rods. Man, didn't expect that. Uh, But I like it. I like it a lot, don't you? Aaron's snake just got bigger and bigger as the magician's snakes were scarfed up. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, Jesus said. And if you come across any serpents, they will not hurt you. Mark 16, verse 18. And as you remember, Paul putting wood on the fire when the snake in the sticks felt the heat, it fastened its fangs on his hand. Observing this, the natives decided that Paul must be guilty of murder to deserve such a fate. But then when they saw him shake it off, the snake, into the fire, and they felt no harm from it, no ill effect, they changed their minds about him. And he was able to give a grand and powerful witness for Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 28. As believers, guys, this is the point here is that we're not free from attack. We're not free from the attacks of the enemy. He can attack at any time. He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's come to kill and rob and destroy. And he'll do whatever damage that he can possibly do. And so we're not free from the attack, but we are immune from its effect. Snakes show up and they strike all the time. But we can eat them up. We can shake them off and not be beaten down. Even though the enemy was able to produce snakes, Aaron's rod ate them up. Joshua and Caleb, they were among the group of 12 spies who spied out the land of promise. The land is a glorious place, they said, to the children of Israel upon their return. However, the other 10, hey, there's giants up there. And we're like grasshoppers in their sight. But Joshua and Caleb countered, no, God is with us and these guys will be bread for us. We can eat them up. Numbers chapter 14, verse 9. But the people listened, though, to the 10 instead of the 2. And the result was that they wandered for 40 years. After their entire generation died, Jacob, or Joshua and Caleb were at last allowed to enter the land of promise. And when they arrived... Now at the age of 85 years of age, Caleb was. Caleb said, Joshua, for my inheritance, for the land that I'm supposed to receive, give me the land, he said specifically, where the giants are. (laughs) You look at that and you say, why in the world would Caleb make such a request? I'll tell you why. Because he knew something about giants. He knew that they were bred. He knew that if he was hungry, it would be give me the challenges which challenge others. Give to me the giants and pass me the butter because they're bread to us. Don't run from the challenges, guys. I'm just giving you a little sidestep here. Don't run from the obstacles. Don't try to shelter yourself necessarily, unnecessarily. Instead, say, here's a chance for me. Like Aaron's rod, here's a chance for me to grow bigger and bigger. It's a way for me, like Caleb, to grow spiritually stronger. It's a way for you, like Caleb, to grow spiritually stronger. Verse 13, in Pharaoh's heart, guess what? He hardened his own heart and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. That's what he's going to do. He's going to do exactly that. That's exactly what he did. And even though Aaron's rod swallowed the other snakes, Pharaoh's heart held on to the fact that his magicians were able to copy Aaron's miracle to some extent. And he did not listen to God. So after the battle of the snake rods, 
we begin the process of the ten plagues. And there are some interesting things about these judgments. But they seem to be grouped in threes. The first, the fourth, and the seventh judgments at the beginning of each cycle of three are introduced by the words, in the morning. Chapter 7, verse 15. Chapter 8, verse 20, and 9, 13. In plagues 1, 2, and 3, we'll find Aaron using his staff. Chapter 7, verse 19, chapter 8, verse 5 and 6, and then 16 and 17 of chapter 8. But then, plagues 4 through 6, no staff was used. And then in plagues 7 through 9, Moses used the staff again. Just little tidbits of, of, of information that you look at and you go, why, why that? Study it, guys. But Moses uses the staff again. And then the third plague ends with the defeat of the magicians. Chapter 8, verse 19. The sixth ends with their inability to stand before Moses. Chapter 9, verse 11. And the ninth ends with the separation of Moses and Pharaoh. Chapter 10 and in verse 28. As you look at this, it seems likely that the plagues take place over a period of about nine months. The first plague of turning the Nile into blood taking place in August when the annual flooding of the Nile River took place. The seventh plague is mentioned as taking place when barley ripens, which would be January. And the final plague of death of the firstborn takes place in April, the time of the Passover. And so verse 14 tells us, So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning when he goes out to the water and you shall stand by the river's bank to meet him. And the rod which was turned into a serpent you shall take in your hand. Archaeologists suggest that Pharaoh was at one of the many temples that were along the banks of the Nile River, perhaps going through annual rituals to the Nile gods with the coming of the annual floods, whatever it might be, the Lord continues with his instructions. And he says in verse 16, And you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now, you would not hear. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand. And they shall be turned to blood. This is going to be a parallel to the third sign that Moses was to give to the Israelites. You remember sign one? Snake, rod. Sign two was leprosy when he stuck it in and brought it out. The third sign was the water being turned into blood. In Exodus chapter 4 verse 9, it says, And it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on the dry land. And the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. So now it's going to be used with Pharaoh to change and challenge his unbelief. Turn the blood. Some have bantered around with this and said that it was caused by a red selting, a particular dirt in the riverbed. Not an uncommon thing to happen in the Nile, but the problem is that this natural phenomenon does not result in the death of fish on the Nile. So there's some inconsistencies that are given here. Whether this was actual blood or just the appearance of blood, something devastating was about to happen to the Nile. Verse 18, And the fish that are in the river shall die. The river shall stink, and the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of this river. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your rod and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their streams, over their rivers, over their ponds, over all their pools of water, that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. So the miracle, the, the miracle wasn't going to affect just one little tiny area of the Nile. 
it was going to affect all the tributaries as well as the water that had been stored in buckets and pitchers and whatnot. Verse 20, And Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded. And so he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. The fish that were in the river died. The river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river. So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Blood everywhere, everywhere. In rivers and streams and ponds and puddles and wooden buckets and stone. Guys in the pop machines, the water purifiers, swimming pools, garden hoses. You name it, it was all filled with blood. And Pharaoh's magicians turned water into blood as well. But here's the question. Where did they get the water? The answer is we find that they had dug it up. And that to me is just brilliant. The whole nation is dying of thirst. So what did Pharaoh's magicians do? They turned the only remaining water supply into blood. And here's the thing, guys. Same, Satan, demons, and dark forces can and do perform powerful feats. But in every single case, their actions only make things worse. Satan never does anything. Demons never do a single thing which makes things better. They don't have that within them. Yes, they can make more snakes, more blood, and more frogs. But all they do is multiply the difficulty. People can truly tap into demonic power through Psychic hotlines, astrology, Ouija boards, tarot cards, you name it. But you got to know this. You only make things, they only make things worse. Demonic power never under any circumstances in any way proves to make things better. It just makes a bigger mess. So we see God having brought a judgment against the gods of Nile, including the gods Happy, Kunim, Sobek, or Os- Ostracis. Uh, these guys, these gods who were supposedly the ones that brought life to Egypt are now bringing just one big, huge stink. And then in verse 22, the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments and Pharaoh's heart grew harder. And he did not heed them as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house. Neither was his heart moved by this. And so Pharaoh returned to his palace and he put in order to put it all out of his mind. Verse 24, So all the Egyptians dug around the river for water to drink because they could not drink the water of the river. So you see there, they're, they're finding good spots of water as they dig uh, just a distance, a short distance away from the uh, Nile River. Um, but again, here you got the magicians taking it from them, trying to turn it and doing, turn it into blood. It's crazy. It, just, it must have been a, cataclysmic scene just crazy you know I, someone had shown me some pictures of uh, Kentucky and just how devastating the area is back there and, and my thought was like this is bad but it's nowhere near as bad as it's going to be during the tribulation period and I, just thinking in ways that, in which to communicate with those that are lost those that are saying oh it's going to be better just to go and party with my friends or do this or do that. It's not going to be any better. You know, they need to go, I think, and just walk down a street there and just realize that it's going to be a hundred times, more than a hundred times, worse off in terms of the destruction and the damage. Verse 25, and seven days passed after the Lord had struck the river. So for seven days, the land of Egypt was a bloody mess. Just as for seven years, the tribulation is going to produce a horrific, awful mess. Moses, the lawgiver, turned water into blood. Jesus, the life giver, turned water into wine. The law was a schoolmaster to show us that we cannot be religious. That even our best efforts at spirituality produce nothing more than death. Death of peace, death of freedom, death of hope. But once we realize, once we embrace Jesus as the one who pulls us out of the quicksand of sin and death, 
we are then free to drink deeply of the wine of great, great joy. So whether this means that the blood in the river lasted seven days or it's a reference to the time that Nile turned the blood when, between that time and when God next speaks in Exodus chapter 8, verse 1, we're not really sure on that. But what we are sure of is we need to be careful not to resist the truth. Second Timothy chapter 3. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Understand the connection between Exodus and Revelation because there's a lot of parallels that are found in there. And Timothy confirms this in chapter 3 when he says, know that the last days, perilous times will come. Paul is going to give us a description of life in the last days. Tell me if any of this sounds familiar to you. Verse 2, 2 Timothy 3. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins led away by various lusts. Guys, not all the TV preachers are crooks, but there are some who are only in the ministry to make a buck. I oftentimes think of these guys when I read this passage and others, how they take advantage of people with their sweet talk. Verse 7, still in 2 Timothy 3, it says, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Guys, our world is swimming in knowledge, but somehow truth gets obscured. The truth about God, the truth about Jesus Christ, the truth about his Holy Spirit. Verse 8, still in 2 Timothy 3, now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these who also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further. For their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. The magicians, they were resisting the truth. Their little tricks were keeping them and the the Egyptians from paying attention to the true God. You might be tired of hearing those Christians talk about how they can't live without Jesus. But perhaps, you know, you think you've learned to uh, get along without Jesus. The problem is you're deceiving yourself. You are deceiving yourself. Verse 10 goes on to say, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, talking to those who have given their life to Christ. The manner of life, the purpose, the faith, the long-suffering, the love, the perseverance. Persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and Iconium, Paul talking, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. This isn't a promise to be claimed or that we even like to claim. But it's a fact that all who follow Jesus are going to go through rough times. And then verse 13, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and be assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped in every good work. That's what God wants of each of us. 
And you see, we have a choice. We have a choice either to resist the truth or to walk in the truth. Seems to me the choice is based on what we do with the scriptures. Saying no to God only makes it more difficult for us. The judgments that came upon Egypt and the deliverance of Israel will progress from difficult to impossible as we read because Pharaoh will continue to resist what God is wanting to do. So what is the truth? The truth is you need Jesus. You need Jesus. The truth is he loves you. The truth is he died for you. And the truth is he wants to forgive you. And he can deliver you. He can get you to the promised land. Amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, for the nuggets. I know there's a lot that we went through, Lord, and certainly it warrants us spending a little more time, uh, Lord, just maybe even looking it over ourselves. But I pray that, Father, you would tuck these nuggets away in, in our life by your Holy Spirit, Lord. Father, I pray that it's just buried there within us. And Lord, by your Holy Spirit, when necessary, that you can bring it forth, that you can bring it up as we need it, that you bring it to our memories, Lord. And so, Father, we just thank you for your word, that it never comes back void, that, Lord, once it's in there, it's there. And we pray, God, that you would just use it in our life daily as we share your good news, as we share your awesome power, as we share your ability and capability. And Lord, just share the message that you want people to know and that is people need to know that you save, that you forgive, that Lord, you died for us and you deliver us. And we thank you for your love. Help us to be carriers of that love, Lord. Help us to be those that, Lord, are a witness, a tower, a strong tower, Lord, a lighthouse in the midst of a hurting world, that we might share your love, your grace, and your mercy. For, Lord, we ask it now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen guys. Love one another. Good job.